Welcome back to another episode of The Jacob Johnston Show. If you go through and you take a look at the media, every so often, one outlet will decide to do some introspective, you know, to analyze their past reports and, you know, try to do a segment about why there is so little trust in media today. And they'll go through and they'll admit to all of the fake news that they have pushed in the past. Of course, when they do this, they're not doing it because they plan to actually change and do more journalism. It's because they're trying to go through and trying to gain back some of their credibility by saying, hey, we recognize the problems of the past. Therefore, you know, going forward, we're going to change. We're going to be different. We're going to be better than our competition, and we're going to do more fact-checking and more objective journalists. Now, while they do this, they also can't help themselves but to maybe push additional fake news or, you know, try to attack, you know, their political opposites. You know, and when I say that is we know that the media is dominated by a bunch of left wing uh, activists pretending to be journalists. And so even when they try to do some introspective, you know, analysis they still need to attack their political opponents. And we've seen this uh, with Hill TV's, you know, The Rising. Now, I don't know if they have an actual TV channel or if it's just a YouTube. Well, I cut the cable long ago, and therefore, you know, I don't know if they have an actual channel. But when it goes through uh, and I take a look at their YouTube channel, I caught this, you know, segment here where they try to act like, you know, they're doing some analysis and trying to explain, you know, why there's so little trust in media and they admit to all the fake news that they have pushed, but they couldn't help themselves but to attack President Trump. Let's go ahead and take a look. And think about the broader context here if we zoom out, right? These news organizations, they paint themselves as victims. Oh, we're under threat. Oh, you know, the president's crying about fake news, which look, I'm, first of all, I think the yeah. president does go way too far with that stuff and it is damaging, but they never do any self-reflection about why is it that we lost the trust of so many people? Why is it that they don't see us as fair? Why is it that they're gravitating towards alternative media sources and to Twitter and to YouTube and independent creators, oh, maybe it's because of incidents like this. Maybe it's because we were wrong about the Iraq war and cheerleaded the nation into that. Maybe it's because we were wrong about the financial crisis. Maybe it's because we were wrong about Russiagate and led you all down a garden path expecting this major reveal of like P tapes and direct phone calls between Putin and Trump or whatever. None of that ever happens. It's blame the public, blame the stupid voters and the stupid public and blame, you know, one demagogue rather than ever understand that the only way that that kind of rhetoric has power is when it has a grain of truth. Yeah. Okay, so let's go through and break down and analyze what they were saying. So they were saying blame a demagogue, you know, and blame the, you know, audience, blame the voters, right? Now, demagogue, you know, what they are going through and they're trying to say, well, some of it is Trump's fault. He goes too far in calling out the fake news for pushing fake news and that he is a demagogue. And that is the problem why there's so many, you know, things uh, that is eliminating or eroding the trust in media. Well, you know, trying to blame Trump for the erosion of trust in media, you know, is dishonest in and of itself. I mean, for instance, let me just take a clear example. Someone comes out to you and goes, look at that. That is a nice, beautiful yellow sky. And you go, that's not a yellow sky. You know, what are you, you know, blind? You know, why do you need to lie? Obviously, the sky is blue. Or, you know, depending on the time of day, you know, maybe it's grayish, you know, because of the clouds or, you know, at nighttime when it's just black because it has no color, you know, whatever. But, you know, they try to say the sky is yellow. You point out that the sky is blue and that they are wrong. And all of a sudden they accuse you of being a demagogue and that you're the reason why there is no trust in anybody reporting on the color of the sky. You know, and that's where they try to go through and attack Trump for calling out the media. You know, calling out a liar for being a liar is not being a demagogue. It's just pointing out a simple fact, a simple truth. Now, 
were they going through this segment because they're actually going to change or be different? No. I mean, they're just thinking that by providing a little bit of honesty, maybe you'll give them another look, another chance. And, you know, they are different from, you know, their competitors. And they see a weakness that maybe if they just admit to it every so often, they can, you know, regain trust. Not that they actually plan on changing how they do their reporting. Now, with that, they also promoted the whole, you know, you know, it was a lie about why we went into Iraq. No, we actually found 500 tons of yellow cake in Iraq, and we found a whole cache of chemical weapons. But they want to go off and go, well, the chemical weapons, they were deteriorated, they weren't, you know, uh, useful, they couldn't be used. Well, yeah, but you didn't find them until 15 years after the initial evasion, 15 years of them being in an uncontrolled environment, deteriorating without any maintenance. The question isn't what condition was it in when you found it 15 years later, you know, and the fact that it took us 15 years to find it, but what condition were they in 15 years ago when they were being maintained in a controlled environment? You know, but they don't want to recognize that. They don't want to go through and actually look at it that way. They want to take a look at it, what it was like after 15 years of neglect. But in any event, and going through here, you see how while they were going through and admitting to all the fake news that they have promoted in the past, they still couldn't help themselves but to attack Trump and try to claim that him calling out the media is demagoguery. But, you know, they don't want to concede quite, you know, so much that the media's engagement in fake news and promoting propaganda to attack Trump. They don't want to say that it is actually the media who are full of demagogues. You know, they just want to say, well, we just got a bunch of things, you know, wrong. And because of the, uh, the things that we got wrong, you know, that has eroded trust. And, you know, a demagogue, you know, works because, well, you know, there's still a grain of truth. You know, there's only a grain of truth to how fake the media actually is. And that's why demagoguery works. It's not that the media is the demagogues constantly pushing, you know, fake information to attack Trump. And then Trump's just calling them out by pointing out actual facts. Now, does Trump, you know, everything Trump say, you know, an actual fact? No. You know, Trump does embellish. He is a little bombastic. He is a showman. You know, so sometimes, you know, he goes through, he exaggerates things out of proportion, you know, using words like huge or the likes of which the world has never seen. And we all, you know, know that there is nobody who is 100% accurate with everything. But if we were to compare, you know, Trump to the media, Trump is much more reliable and honest, and Trump is at least honest about who and what he is. The media goes through and pretends like they're objective journalists reporting the truth, pushing a bunch of fake information without any fact-checking or evidence to support it. In fact, they go beyond you know, just neglecting journalism. They doctor videos. They doctor audio clips. They doctor evidence in order to try and manufacture a narrative, you know? And so while it's nice, you know, every so often to hear them admit to them being, you know, a bunch of fake news propagandists, the fact that they can't just, you know, objectively go, okay, you know, we realize, you know, that we've allowed our, you know, political ideology to blind us, you know, going forward, we're going to be objective journalists. no. They don't do that. They just come out because they believe this is a tactic in order to try and, you know, bring back an audience at least temporarily so that they can boost their ratings, boost their numbers, and try to, you know, get people trapped into an, another round of fake news. So, you know, at least they, you know, will admit to, to what it is they do, but Unfortunately, it doesn't mean they're going to change. Okay, so moving along here, you know, when we take a look at the Democrat Party, you know, some people go off and say they're all evil. 
No, I mean, you understand that the party leadership, they at least understand and know what it is they're actually doing, you know, and the horrible policies in which they're promoting. But, you know, most of the other members, they're just clueless. They don't actually understand what it is they're promoting because they don't do the research. They don't do the analysis. In fact, you know, they go out so badly that they don't even seem to own a dictionary and they don't even look up, you know, the definitions of the words they use, which is why they sound so completely ridiculous. And this has become, you know, part of a pattern here whereby the left, when they are trying to promote a policy and all of that, they go off and say, well, anybody who disagrees with me, uh, they're a racist, they're a fascist, they're a sexist, they're a, you know, name whatever. And they do that because they can't actually back up anything uh, that they say with any facts, data, or evidence. You know, so they've gotten used to just throwing a bunch of insults and names at their political opponents. The problem is they don't seem to actually know what the definition of the words they use are. And this becomes more uh, evident when you take a look at, you know, those who are promoted as the rising stars within the Democrat Party, the likes of AOC, who often, you know, gets mocked because she doesn't seem to have a clue about anything she talks about. She uses a bunch of words and throws out a bunch of things, but she doesn't actually seem to have any comprehension of what it is she's saying. So let's go ahead and take a look at a clip here of AOC on The Breakfast Club. What do you think about former Mayor Bloomberg running for president? What are your thoughts? I think it's him? not a good idea. I think our experiences um, have seen this, you know, from stop and frisk to the surge in housing costs in New York City. I think they Elected feel like he could beat Trump, and that's, that's the main thing. That's I what think, I think people look at. That's not enough for me, just somebody that can beat Trump. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, we, obviously we have to beat Trump, but if we beat Trump and go back to the same policies that we had before, a worse Trump is going to come, a Trump that's more sophisticated, whose fascism is less obvious. OK, so she's going off there and talking about fascism. You know, Trump is a fascist, but did she ever actually taken the time to look up the definition of fascism? Has she ever gone through and taken a look at, you know, the policies and the ideology of the Democrats versus the Republicans and you know, thought, hmm, which one of these actually fits the definition of fascism? Well, you know, luckily, I'm going to be able to provide you the definition. Now, I'm using a left-wing, you know, source of information and dictionary, Wikipedia, which, as we know, Wikipedia is not the most accurate or reliable source of information because it's dominated by a bunch of left-wing ideologues. But... You know, what I like to do here is use even left-wing sources to debunk left-wing talking points. So let's go ahead and take a look here at what fascism is. You know, fascism is a form of government that is a one-party dictatorship. Uh, then it uses, you know, totalitarian, but it goes, the aim is to prepare the nation for armed conflict and respond to economic difficulties. Now, preparing the nation for armed conflict and economic difficulties in and of itself is not actual fascism. This is the problem with Wikipedia. That is what the government is designed to do, that if armed conflict is on its way, you prepare your population, you prepare your nation. That way you're not dominated and overthrown and, you know, now conquered by another country. And responding to economic difficulties, well... You know, the goal of all government is to provide a stable, safe, and prospering government. You know, so that itself is where the definition goes wrong. But it's this next part. Fascism puts nation and often race above the individual. It stands for centralized government headed by a dictator. So let's go through here and take a look uh, for just a moment. Between the two parties, which party believes in a limited government uh, with individual rights? And which party believes in a strong, overarching, uh, centralized government in control of everything 
and takes a look at people not as individuals, but as groups, as classes. Hmm. Well, it becomes very simple. I mean, let's take a look at this. The Democrat Party believes everybody should be categorized based off of race, gender, religion, and orientation. They put everybody into a box, and then what you say or do is viewed through the, through the lens of what box you belong to. You know, and that, that box, you know, is what determines whether or not your actions or behaviors is right, wrong, and immoral or moral, and not the action itself. You know, they believe in the government takeover of everything. I mean, uh, health care, they want to, you know, control you know, your ability to exercise your constitutional rights. You know, they've gone through, they've banned plastic straws, and they tried to even control how much pop you can drink at one time. Hmm. That was the Democrats. The Republicans are always talking about how big government is bad, that the government should only do a few things, and that, you know, control, you know, our government control should be more local where people have more say in uh, and influence into the policies and laws. You know, the Republicans believe that actions are more important than words, and they celebrate the individual regardless of what skin color or genitalia that individual has. Whereas the, you know, Republicans will take a look at illegal immigration and their only complaint is, hey, this is the law for how you come to the United States. You broke that law. You should not be rewarded. Whereas the Democrats say, you know, yeah, this is what the law says, but, you know, your skin color means that you shouldn't, you know, be subjected to that particular law. Therefore, we're going to let you in. Or, hey, you know, your skin color dictates that the law should be applied to you, yada, yada, yada. You know, they never look at people as individuals. They look at them as groups and, you know, boxes. So if we were to go through and take a look at the definition of fascism, and we take a look at the ideologies of the two parties, it's because AOC doesn't have a clue what she's talking about, never does any research, never does any fact checks, and never even looks up the definitions of the words that she uses, you know, that you know, allows so much content to be produced about what an ignoranus she is. You know, some may even call her a meathead, but she is not the only one. She is just the one who is more predominantly displayed in the media. This is something that is, you know, found throughout the entire left, where they just say words, but they don't know what the words they say mean. You know, and they just throw them at their political opponents, and they don't understand that they themselves are pushing the type of government and policies that they claim to be against, you know, because they believe their words are more important than their actions, which is why they can push for fascism, for totalitarianism, for an authoritarian, and believe that they are against it because they just don't have a clue what they're talking about. Someone, please send AOC a dictionary and highlight, you know, some of the words that she uses so that she can actually read the definition. Maybe if she actually did any research and looked up things, she might start to get a clue what it is she's talking about. But right now, like so many on the left, she is completely clueless, right? And yeah, it's just one of those situations where they keep claiming to be against what it is they promote and they keep claiming their opponents are for what their opponents are actually against. You know, and, you know, maybe, you know, if I were to give AOC credit, maybe she does understand this. She just doesn't care because she is not concerned about truth or facts. She's concerned about power and how to get more of it, that she is just all about marketing you know, like so many fascists and dictators or whatever, what they market, you know, themselves to be and how they want to promote themselves 
and their policies and what they actually intend to do are completely different. And maybe she is smarter than I give her credit for. And she just knows that she cannot stay in power if she actually told people the truth. All right. So there's another article that I have read here that, you know, was interesting. It comes from Breitbart. And you got to love it when you go through and you're able to use left wing, you know, um, marketing or left wing, you know, uh, thought processes or left wing logic against them. Right. And so this has been, you know, one of those great situations in which we're able to go through and then watch the left try to stumble or try to twist things around to avoid acknowledging that, hey, if what you're saying is true, then X. So, for instance, you know, coming from Breitbart, you know, if voter ID is a tax on voting rights, firearm licensing is a tax on Second Amendment rights. You know, uh, Tom Massey uh, made this point while cross-examining voter ID opponent, contending that their arguments uh, break down if they oppose issuance of IDs for one's constitutional rights, but look the other way when IDs are required for the exercise of a different right. Of course, the person he was arguing goes, uh, well, let me tell you this, that the whole business of being able to vote is not... Uh, Inter meshed with the business of bearing arms. Well, why not? You know, they're both constitutional rights. You know, so they're trying to differentiate, you know, that it's okay to tax one constitutional right, but not okay to tax another constitutional right because somehow it's different based off, and the only difference is based off of what the person arguing from the left actually likes or dislikes. But in any ways, you are taking the time that we are trying to deal with a constitutional right to be a citizen and turning it into something else. Well, no, the right to bear arm is about a constitutional right, you know, um, of being a citizen, you know, anyways, you know, um, it goes on, use another form. So basically, you know, what had happened in this is that, you know, they're talking about voter ID laws, you know, is what they wanted to go off and say and say, you know, if you have to have an ID to vote, that is like a poll tax. That is taxing your exercise of a constitutional right. Now, that doesn't really make sense because IDs is something that pretty much almost everybody already has anyways in order to function in a society. You need an ID uh, to drive, you know, a driver's license. You need a picture ID in order to open up a bank account. You need a picture ID to buy uh, tobacco or alcohol products. You need ID to get into certain places. So you already need a picture ID, a photo ID, in order to do so much in today's life, in order to get around in today's society. Because it's used for so many things. So saying that you need to present the ID that, you know, you already have is a poll tax doesn't make sense. But, of course, they're also arguing that minorities are somehow mentally deficient. I've covered this before where the idea of saying that, you know, minorities can't be expected to figure out how to get a uh, photo ID in order to vote you know, is saying that you believe that any minority driving is doing so illegally because they couldn't figure out how to get a license or that minorities, you know, don't have bank accounts or that minorities, you know, are unable to function in regular society. You know, it's the idea that, you know, if you're a minority, you're somehow intellectually deficient is what the left is promoting by trying to say that, you know, the minorities can't be expected to figure out how to get a photo ID like a driver's license. But the left is trying to say that that is like a poll tax. Well, then if that is like a poll tax, then going off and saying, hey, you have to you know, pay the government in order to exercise your Second Amendment rights is a tax on your constitutional rights as well. Because when you go off and you 
take a look at firearms, well, you have to go through and pay the government in order to get a permit to purchase a firearm, at least in my home state uh, here in Iowa. You know, uh, the process is, you know, depending on whether or not you have a, a concealed carry permit already, but if you don't have a concealed carry permit, then you need to pay a fee in order to get a, you know, a, a license in order to purchase a firearm. It's called a permit to purchase, you know, and then if you want to carry your firearm, you have to pay, you know, uh, the government for a license to allow you to carry around your firearm, even though the Second Amendment says shall not be infringed. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And, you know, paying the government for a license in order to carry around a firearm that you are by the Constitution, you know, uh, able to do without being infringed upon, well, then that, you know, licensing, you know, in order to carry your firearm is a tax on your constitutional rights. Now, the Democrats, having no argument for this, try to go off and avoid the conversation by saying, well, that's different, you know, and you're trying to distract from this forum, so therefore we're just not going to talk about that because they can't argue it because it is using their very logic you know, against them. It is using their very logic and throwing it in their face. Why is it that it's okay to tax this constitutional right, you know, by what you're claiming to be a tax, but it is wrong to tax this other constitutional right? Why is it that, you know, whether or not a constitutional right and the exercising thereof, you know, being okay or not okay to tax, being based off of your political beliefs, but you don't, you know, think the other way around? You know, and this goes through the hypocrisy of the Democrat Party, where they want to go off and, you know, try to claim, you know, that everything is different. Every constitutional right and your ability to exercise it is treated unequally. You know, they want to get rid of voter ID laws because, well, voter ID laws are actually about protecting the integrity of the election. Because if you go through and you take a look at, you know, how the elections go, and we'll talk about this later on, you know, there's so much fraud because people don't actually have to show that they are who they say they are, or even show that they're actually a citizen legally able to vote. You know, but the Democrats are claiming that anything designed to protect the integrity of the election and ensure that the people voting are actual citizens with the legal ability to vote, that's a tax and therefore that's unconstitutional. But exercising your constitutional right to keep and bear arms, well, that's a different scenario. We have every right to tax that. You know, it, it is this constant hypocrisy, you know, among the Democrats and how they can't handle their own logic because th they're always, you know, situational. You know, this, you know, the logic, uh, you know, changes based off of what they do and don't support. They have no consistency. Why? Because they don't actually believe in the Constitution or the rule of law. They want to make everything up as they go based off of, what benefits their objective and what hinders their objective. And so they will argue both sides of a point just because of a small change in the situation. You know, they want to argue, you know, in this particular case, that the constitutional rights, whether or not it can and can't be taxed, is based on whether or not the Democrats agree with that right. Now, I mean, in all honesty, we are at a point where the government is taxing our exercising of constitutional rights. You know, uh, like to assemble, we got to, you know, get a permit in order to get a, you know, in order to assemble in a place to hold a rally, a protest or anything like that. Now, we understand that there's, you know, maybe a little bit of a complexity there. Well, these are public spaces. We got to deal with some maintenance. And so we're not taxing, you know, you're exercising the rights. We're taxing the resources that are used up when exercising your rights. And so there are, you know, s some ways uh, that you can look at it. But 
if you were to go by the Democrats' actual argument, then having to pay the government anything, you know, any type of fee, you know, any type of licensing, any type of money transaction in order to actually go through and exercise your rights, well, then that means the government shouldn't be able to tax anything or be involved in anything. You shouldn't have to go through and pay the government to buy a firearm. You should be just be able to go in there, buy a firearm and leave, you know, or go in there and, you know, get a quick background check. And as long as the background check is good, leave. You shouldn't have to be able to or be forced to pay the government for a permit or license. So you got to love it when, you know, you're able to throw left-wing logic back at them and then watch them squirm and watch them try and justify or explain away, you know, why they think it's different based off of what they do and do not support. Okay, so going on here, there are there are some stories that come out that, you know, you want to get excited about. You want to go, oh, yes, but then again, you want to go, wait, 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 wait. Let's slow down. We don't want to be like the left and jump the gun and report things that we don't actually have all the facts for. You know, and this is one of those things. Now, Fox News, you know, is reporting, but they're reporting not, you know, that this is the case, but they're reporting on what somebody else has said. You know, and that's where, you know, you get, you know, some journalism making a clear distinction between what you've uncovered yourself and what you're just report and whether or not you're just reporting on other people's statements and all of that. So in this particular case, uh, Fox News is uh, reporting in an article here that Re- uh, Rep. Uh, Doug Collins, uh, Republican Georgia, uh, suggested uh, Thursday at the uh, Conservative Political Action Conference or CPAC that U.S. Attorney John Durham's uh, investigation into the origins of the Russia probe will lead to criminal charges. This is not going to be a Mueller report. There won't be a report, Collins told Fox News, noting that Durham and his team have kept very quiet about their work. When uh, he's ready to charge people, he'll charge people. Now, he does note that, you know, uh, Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, you know, expanded uh, the reach of Durham's investigation into the intelligence community and gave him grand jury. Uh, Okay, so in taking a look at this, you know, it's easy to get excited. Yes, there's going to be criminal charges. Yes, you know, the left is finally going to have to suffer the consequences for their illegal actions and behaviors. But then again, this article and this story isn't saying uh, that there's any, you know, thing to substantiate that claim. It's just saying that, you know, one person's belief is that there's going to be criminal charges. And I want to believe that. I want to believe that there is equality in the law and that the law, you know, is applied equally to everybody. And it shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat. If you break the law, you should be held accountable. But experience, on the other hand, has shown us that, you know, Democrats tend to be above the law. You know, they never have to face the consequences of their actions and behaviors that while they go out there again, differentiating between what they say and what they do while the Democrats are going out there saying no one is above the law while they're trying to attack president Trump experience shows us that the Democrats actually do believe they're above the law. I mean, they've engaged in so much criminal and illegal activities engaging in an international spying operation to influence the outcome of the election uh, paying foreign entities and organizations to make accusations against political opponents and then taking their paid for information and getting it circulated through government in order to open up an investigation uh, to be able to spy on their political opponents, so on and so forth. And, you know, using government to try and oust political opponents uh, for no actual you know, verified evidence-based reason, you know, so in any event, I want to be able to believe this, but I want to, you know, say caution everybody, don't jump the gun and start celebrating. 
At this point, when it comes to holding the left accountable, you know, to their actions and behaviors and being subjected to the same laws as everybody else, I'll believe it when I see it. Now, also at CPAC, you know, a former uh, Flynn deputy, now McFarland reveals new details of Mueller interviews. Now, I always get kind of, you know, suspicious about new details coming out about something. It's like, well, why did you wait so long? You know, I mean, the Mueller investigation and the Mueller, you know, probe has been over for a while. Why didn't you just come out and spill this all at once? Why did you wait all this time later? But if this is true, this would be devastating. You know, so the former uh, White House Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, McFarlane, revealed the new details about her interviews as part of, you know, former Special Counsel Mueller, um, Robert Mueller's investigation. Uh, McFarlane said agents described her as a fact witness in the investigation and said she spent hours and hours being interviewed. She explained uh, that the agents and prosecutors from Mueller's office met with her several times, showing her parts of a document uh, or phone logs, right, and asked her questions about them. But she didn't remember. You know, so going through and saying, hey, we're only going to show you bits and pieces of a document or of a phone log and then expect you to remember everything. Now, she goes off and says, well, I didn't remember, you know, and they were able to take Trump tweets, excerpts uh, from text messages, things I said, she explained. And they said, we think you should remember these things. And if you don't remember, we think that's perjury. Now, think about how dangerous that is, that if they show you a partial document or a partial text or they show you something that maybe you were part of a of a chain, you know, and you know an email chain or something, and they go, can you you know um, you know talk about this a little bit more? And time has gone on. You don't have access to your notes. You don't have access, you know, to the background information. You know, time has gone on. You've done so many other things. You don't really remember all the details of something. It's not like. You know, you have a video recording of everything you say or do every moment of the day to go back and go, hey, this is what I was thinking. This is what was going on. No, when you have to rely solely on memory, there are things that you don't remember because what they're cherry picking out of these documents are maybe things that weren't really the main point or was only discussed in passing or was just a side detail that you weren't really a part of. But think about that. Not remembering something is perjury? Well, that explains how they you know, got around to charging Michael Flynn with making false statements to the FBI because he didn't actually make a false statement. They just want to say that saying that you don't remember something because you're just trying to, re, you know, recall on the fly without having access to all your notes or information, not remembering something is perjury. Now, perjury has an actual definition, you know, and this is where I believe that, you know, for a lot of people on the left and, you know, that are left wing activists really need a dictionary. Perjury means you're intentionally lying or deceiving, not honestly stating that I don't remember all the details of that. I only have a vague recollection of what that was about. You know, uh, I would need to consult my notes and see the entire document to help jog my memory. Memory is not 100% perfect, but it is dangerous, completely dangerous to go off there and try and claim that, you know, not remembering something is the same as perjury. You know, that is a horrible, horrible way to go about applying the law. But then again, going back to uh, the last, you know, segment here about the Second Amendment, using left-wing logic against them Think of all the times that the Democrats, 
you know, when talking about a, a situation in which they're involved in a scandal, have said, I don't remember that. That's not uh, to my recollection. That's not how I remember the situation. Well, if you apply the same logic that the left is trying to employ here back on them, then that means every time the Democrats have stated, I don't remember, such as Hillary Clinton, for example, then that means that Hillary Clinton has perjured herself before Congress hundreds of times by now, right? Are we now going to go ahead and have a Hillary Clinton arrested for perjury? Because, you know, think about this. If they're saying that, you know, the statement, I don't remember and not remembering something is the same thing as perjury, go back and take a look at Hillary Clinton's congressional testimonies during hearings. Take a look at how many times she says she doesn't remember something when questioned by uh, Republicans, and then we'll count each instance as perjury. I think uh, by then, you know, we'll definitely have a felony on our hands with how many times she perjured herself, and she'll spend the rest of her days behind bars. You know, you want to apply that same logic both ways, but no, Democrats are hypocrites. They go, well, when a Democrat says they don't remember, they honestly don't remember. When a Republican says they don't remember, it's just because, you know, they are lying about not remembering because they don't want to admit the truth because they know the truth will land them in jail. You know, and that's how they'll try and explain it away, how the Democrats go about, you know, all of this. You know, try applying the logic both ways. Or think about this. How about every time in your life when you couldn't remember something? And someone asked you something and you go, I don't remember. Were you lying? Were you intentionally lying? Now, maybe some of you were some of the time, but were you lying every time you told someone that you just didn't remember or recall a specific situation or instance? Or were you honestly saying you don't remember? You know, this is again, you know, the left throwing out an accusation uh, without actually looking at the definition of the words they are using, and then refusing to apply that same logic or standard back on themselves. It, it, it is really amazing how they're able to get away with doing this time and time again. Now, I got another thing uh, that I want to talk about, and I know I, on today's episode, for some reason, I'm using Fox News um, you know, articles a lot more than I normally do. I like to get more of a mix and mesh of various sources, but Fox News, you know, it, it just really had a good day of reporting, and I was able to take a look at a lot of things uh, that were going on. You know, so, and going through here, you know, a group threatens lawsuit over suspiciously high voter registration rates in swing states. And this is uh, something that should be uh, concerning to absolutely everybody. You know, um, so it goes on to read that voters in Florida, Michigan, and Colorado are threatening to sue their state after an independent organization discovered that each uh, has counties with unusually high voter registration rates. Now, you can go, well, maybe people are just getting more motivated or you know, uh, involved in politics. And so, you know, every so often you'll have st statistical outliers. But as we go through and we take a look at this, uh, the data, you know, compiled by the Honest Election Project, um, which is a new nonprofit organization that blames uh, the seemingly implausible statistics on the failure of states to properly update voter rolls to account for people moving, dying, or being incarcerated. You know, so let's take a look at this for a moment, and I, I will come back uh, to this to take a look at some of the other findings. But, you know, Project Veritas uh, a while ago uh, in the last election, you know, uncovered a lot of problems that are going on uh, in the election. Wow. Got a kid uh, up there stomping around. But one of the things that he found out uh, was from some of the Democratic operatives was them admitting that, you know, we've been bussing people around for 50 years and we're going to keep doing it. 
you know, we're going to vote three, four, five times, you know, which undermines, you know, that video confession kind of undermines the claims that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. And it goes, well, how many times did people vote? And, you know, was the voting restricted to just citizens, you know, versus illegal immigrants in a lot of these big populist states. But in any event, you know, getting back to, you know, Project Veritas, you know, uh, undercover video where he talked about busing people around. And then you take a look at this article and this finding about how the voter rolls, you know, are not being updated when people move or die or, you know, getting incarcerated. What does that mean? Well, if people moved, you know, to, you know, um, you know, to a different county or a different part of their state, you know, and they plan on it uh, enough, well, then they can go through vote in the county in which they currently live and then drive, you know, two, three counties over to where they used to live, where they're still on the voter rolls and vote again. That undermines democracy and the, you know, and the integrity of the election. Or when you talk about people dying or being incarcerated and you realize that they don't allow for voter IDs, you know, you know, you're not allowed to ask for IDs or any uh, proof that the person voting is who they say they are. Then you can go off and say, well, maybe there are some people in government, you know, that are activists, you know, aligned with Democrats, giving them names of people who are deceased or, you know, incarcerated. And so you got one person who will take several identities you know, go to one voting location, claim to be one person, go to another voting location, claim to be another person, you know, and all in all, because no one's checking, you know, their identification or any proof that they are who they say they are, you know, they're going around and voting multiple times, claiming to be various or different people because people are on voter rolls who shouldn't be on the voter rolls because they've moved or they've died. You know, and this is why every election we see, you know, analysis of all that, that, you know, dead people have voted, you know, dead people continue to vote, you know, which, you know, I jokingly respond, how is it that, you know, Democrats are atheists? Every election year, we see the dead rise from the grade, you know, but in any event, you know, because of that, you know, it allows for so much election fraud. Now, There was an attempt to pass a law that says, hey, we need to update the voter rolls. Hey, we need to purge, you know, um, voters who have moved or died, you know, or are incarcerated somewhere else from the voter rolls. And what did the left do? The left came out and tried to say, well, that's voter suppression. You know, the left has come out and tried to say that was trying to suppress votes and, you know, suppress Democrat turnout or make it hard for Democrats to vote and all of that because you're purging the rolls, you know, and so on and so forth, you know, which is kind of, you know, them trying to once again use a false attack and a narrative to try and, you know, prevent uh, any uh, action that would, you know, protect the integrity of the election. Now, This also goes on to say that all three states have multiple counties where voter registration exceeds 90%. In some cases, they even exceed 100%. Think about that for a moment, would you? Think about that, you know, and I'll give you a moment to just process that, that in some counties, the number of people registered to vote exceeds 100% of the eligible voters. You know, there's only one reason for that. And that one and only reason is voter fraud, that there are people on the voter rolls that don't live in that area or, you know, people that don't even exist have managed to get on the voter rolls. You know, which one of that situation is true? Eh, you know, it's hard to really know for sure. But in any event, the Democrats... You know, they don't care about election integrity. They're just going to go off and, you know, try to make up the rules as they go to whatever benefits them. And they, you know, on video are going to brag about all the illegal activities that they engaged in 
and then a claim that it's their opponents that are undermining democracy. Don't you get it? Democracy only exists if the Democrats get elected. Democracy is only something when the Democrats are able to do whatever they want, regardless of the law and constitution, and applying you know uh, integrity to the election and putting everybody you know under the same rules. Well, that's what hurts democracy. Don't you know? The Democrats have let us know about that. Okay, and so, you know, when we go through and take a look at double standards, well, there are maybe some Democrats that are coming up, are coming out and saying, hey, you know, this whole double standard and making up the rules as we go, maybe that isn't such a good thing. Of course, it's not such a good thing because they're trying to run for certain offices and they happen to not be the ones in charge of making up the rules as they go. You know, as Elizabeth Warren has pointed out. Can you explain why the will of the voters should not matter if no candidate reaches a majority of delegates? So you do know that was Bernie's position in 2016? Not necessarily, no. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, won, he won 22 states, so, so he went to the, no, the, the convention for No, that was Bernie's position in 2016 that it should not go to the person who had a plurality. Okay. So, and remember, his last, his last play was to superdelegates. So the way I see this is you write the rules before you know where everybody stands, and then you stick with those rules. And that is exactly right. You know, and Elizabeth Warren was pointing out that, hey, the rules that we are operating under, as, especially with the superdelegates, were the rules that Bernie Sanders pushed for in 2016, because in 2016, that would have benefited Bernie Sanders. But now, here it is in 2020, where those rules that he pushed for back then wouldn't be as beneficial to him now. Well, now he's wanting to change the rules mid-game because, well, those, same, those rules are no longer going to be beneficial to him. He wants new rules that will be designed to benefit him. Of course, the Democrats setting up these double standards or trying to change the rules and make up the rules as they go is nothing different. Take a look at the election. All right, the Constitution is very clear uh, that the president is decided by the Electoral College. And the uh, Constitution is very clear about how the uh, states uh, and their electoral votes are determined. And so we run every election based off of the Electoral College and going through what the Constitution outlined. But, you know, then the Democrats lose the Electoral College, but they go, well, we won the popular vote. Therefore, you know, President Trump, he's illegitimate. He shouldn't be president. It should be Hillary Clinton because of the popular vote. But here's what they don't want to actually admit is that if we actually elected presidents by the popular vote instead of the Electoral College, President Trump would have campaigned differently. You know, President Trump campaigned based off of how the elections are run. He, you know, you don't campaign the same way for the popular vote as you would for the Electoral College vote. You know, and so they don't want to acknowledge that. But if the situation is reversed where, you know, the Democrats won the Electoral College and the Republicans won the popular vote, well, then, you know, okay, yes, that, that's the constitutional process. You know, the, the Democrat president is legitimate. But in the reverse, it's like, well, no, you know, we all knew it was the Electoral College going in, but we don't like the results. Therefore, it should be the popular vote this time. They always want to go through and change the rules based off of whether or not the outcome was what they wanted. You know, so it's this constant double standard and them wanting to go through and make everything up as they go. And of course, making everything up as they go just means, you know, what does and doesn't benefit them. Okay, so I got one more thing here from Fox News, and it's not really anything major. It's just, well, this is just cool. You know, for any science nerds or science fiction fan or sci-fi fan, you know, Navy arms destroyer with new laser weapons. Laser weapons! Yes, now, we've been developing laser weapons for some time. You know, and so it goes on to read that enemy drones 
over the ocean, you know, could track or surveil U.S. Uh, Navy ships and, you know, design them for targets or whatever. But uh, the reality is one of many key reasons uh, the Navy has now installed a new counter drone dazzler laser weapon aboard one of its destroyers. Now, they've been going through and developing laser weapons for quite some time, and they've you know shown how effective they are at taking out drones. Now, I'm excited, although my excitement may be a little diminished by the fact that, you know, the left will make sure that, you know, laser weapons are not, um, you know, covered under the Second Amendment. You know, even though all weapons are actually covered under the Second Amendment, because the Second Amendment is to say, hey, the average person should be uh, just as well armed as the military. Now, I get that, you know, technological developments and all that, that that can be a scary idea, you know, but, you know, in the end, that's the way the Second Amendment was actually designed to be. And laser weapons. Now, if you're someone who's like a Star Trek fan, you're going off and going, yes, now I get it. Star Trek, they call them phasers. And, you know, what is the real difference between a phaser and a laser weapon and yada, 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 or a disruptor, you know, yada, yada, yada. But the idea that it's lasers, you know, and having laser weapons is such a cool and fascinating idea that I can't wait to be able to one day pick up uh, a laser weapon and just test it out to be able to go through and just fire and see what it does. I mean, this is, you know, yes, I'm excited about this. And this is going to be something where we can talk about forever. But in the end, this is another great thing about capitalism or things that were once thought of as science fiction nonsense people have worked on for years and have turned into a reality. How many times have we gone through and turned a science fiction thing into reality? Now, that being said, where's the hoverboard? I want the hoverboard. Yes, if we're going to be able to make lasers, we should be able to make hoverboards. Just maybe, you know, that's my opinion. Okay, so one last thing uh, before we go here. And this is Vox, and I'm not going to play the entire video. You know, I'm just going to go through and play just a, you know, a clip here. And it really kind of highlights that maybe the left just doesn't understand what the heck they're talking about. Or, you know, they should probably go through and take a look at some of the things they say and go, you know, does this really make all that much sense? Today, evangelical Christians are one of the most politically powerful voting blocs in the United States. And in the Trump administration, they've been given unprecedented power. They've turned support for Israel and hostility towards its enemies into core tenets of conservative ideology. And a big part of those policies is rooted in how they interpret the Bible. One of the primary differences between evangelicals and other Christians is their relationship with the Bible. The Bible is sort of this prophetic roadmap for modern life, that events described and prophesied in the Bible will become true. Okay, okay. So they were wanting to go through and they were explaining this in the terms of Israel and Palestine and all of that which is not the point of why I brought up this video. But actually take a look at what they say. The one thing uh, that, that's about you know, uh, evangelical Christians is how they view the Bible. And the difference between them and the denominations is their relationship to that Bible. Well, no kidding! You know, you can say that about any religion. You can say that about, you know, Islam. The difference between the Shias and the Sunnis is their relationship to the Quran and how they interpret the Quran, right? You could say that between Orthodox uh, Jews and secular Jews is their relationships to the Torah and their views of the Torah. No kidding! The reason why there are different denominations of any religion is based off of different interpretations and relationships to their religious texts. It's like, gee, person, you think this is a deep analytical understanding? You know, and then they go off and say, 
So evangelical Christians actually believe in the religious text as true and, you know, a roadmap. And it's like, really? Really? This, this is somehow new information that people actually believe in the religious text of the religion they believe in and practice? No, 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 no. I mean, religious people, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, believe that what they are practicing is fake. You know, what? You know, are, are, are you really going off and thinking that the idea that people actually believe in the religion they practice uh, and the religious text is true and that their relationship to that text and how they've interpreted it and how they view it, develop, you know, informs or influences their actions, behaviors, and policies and the way they live life? Uh, did, did, what? I mean, I, did you actually go through and, you know, look at the script and go, well, you know, of course how people view all of this is going to determine whether or not they practice it and how it shapes their life. Did you? And Vox is, you know, is this gigantic, you know, multi, you know, uh, organization. You know, they're not an independent, you know, small media or anything. They're a gigantic, you know, uh, part of a major multi-billion-dollar corporation. You know, they just try to act like they're small, and they put out this mindless crap and think that, you know, by adding in some music and you know, uh, some good editing that, you know, people won't actually analyze what they say and go, are you stupid? Oh, man. Okay, so that's it. I was going to get into the coronavirus and how the Democrats are using it for partisan attacks and ignoring certain facts and realities and all that, but I don't have the time for that. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. You know, go ahead, share this, hit the like button, uh, comment, you know, leave me a rating and review when you're listening to the audio version of this, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much, and I will be back again soon. Hey, YouTube viewers, thank you so much for your time and attention and watching this video. If you want to get more, click on the video playing off to the side here. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe and the notification bell so that you'll be notified when new videos and content drops. Thank you, and I appreciate